And he called me and he's in tears and he's saying, your brother is gone. Welcome to the show, Trey. Wow, what was an intro. Quite an intro. You haven't <laughs> copyrighted that one, have you? I'm trademarking that, boy. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I feel like I'm really half stripped off of my bloody Fonzie shirt. Tell us where it began. My entrepreneurial journey started with my dad. All I've ever known is if you persevere hard enough, success will happen. My dad would say to me, you know, you're black. You've got to work three times harder than everyone else. And so I did. I didn't complain about it. How was that imparted on you as a kid? Education is literally beaten into you as a kid. And I loved it. I don't say that as a complaint. How much do you think oh you're getting controversial <laughs> talk to me about your illness and your sickness your eyes roll back in your head and you're stiff so, i mean i'm on a hospital bed and i can see the wall behind me clearly and nothing else that's how violent it is the way i coped with it towards the end was try at least you know you can jump off a building you can kill yourself basically if it gets bad Hey, Matt Haycox here with a quick interruption just to say, I hope you're liking the show, but please, please like, subscribe or comment. That's how we can bring you better guests. That's how we can make the show better each week. So please, please, if that's all I ever ask of you, we never charge, we never ask anything else. Just please give us a few moments of your time. Guys, Matt Haycox here and welcome to another episode of Stripping Off with Matt Haycox. And today, we're going to make the body groove and metaphorically strip off with Trey Lowe. Trey is not your average Joe. He's a musical maestro. He's a mentor on a mission, and he's an entrepreneur. From churning out chart toppers like Body Groove to shaking up the business world with Lord Sugar on this year's Apprentice, the guy's done it all. Behind the scenes, he's overcome hurdles. He's founded his own mentoring empire, and he's left a mark on many within the industry. So welcome to the show, Trey. Wow, what was an intro. Quite an intro, Blood. quite an intro. I'm going to nick that one. <laughs> Mentor on a mission. You haven't copyrighted that one, have you? I'm trademarking that, boy. God, what an intro. Now, it's an honour to be here. I feel like I'm really half stripped off of my bloody Fonzie shirt going on here, but hey. Well, I was, get, I was getting worried about stripping you off next to me. I'm going to feel uh, I'm gonna feel slightly inadequate. <laughs> nah, dude, you're not far off. You'd be good. But yeah, no, it's great to be here. So listen, buddy, um, we've got a lot to talk about. Yep. Um, obviously, certainly want to get deep onto The Apprentice and yep. hear, hear, hear all the gossip that's going on there. Um, but there's a big backstory that precedes The Apprentice. Uh, so t so t tell, us, tell us where it began. You know, where, where do your entrepreneurial roots come from? And did, did music start before entrepreneurialism or did it all kind of start together? God, we're going to have a long time. I do talk for England, but let me see if I can condense it down. I think... For me, my entrepreneurial journey started with my dad. Um, we're Nigerian, we're Nigerian Ibo. If you know anything about Nigeria, you know any Nigerian Ibos? Uh, no. Not. I'm the first one, I feel honoured. Let, okay, okay, let, okay. let me try and leave a good impression. <laughs> but I mean, if, if you know anything about our culture, it's all about education, it's all about trade, it's all about commerce. I mean, it's so deeply entrenched in our culture especially the education and, and I mean education is literally beaten into you as a kid you were born in the UK though yeah born in the UK yeah my um dad I mean, I'll have to tell a bit of his story so you get a bit of the context of it so my dad grew up in um, a little village in Nigeria in the east of Nigeria in Ibo land um and he had eight brothers and sisters and he lost seven of them one by one so he lost seven siblings I mean, that's the level of poverty we're talking about. At a young age? Yes, this would have been the 19... I mean, he was born in the 1930s, sort of 1930s, 40s, because he's 85 now. So at a young age, his, his siblings were just dying one by one by one by one by one, and obviously he was next. And in order to save his life, they sent for a relative, like an uncle of him, to come and pick him. And the guy came and got my dad, put him on his shoulders, and walked for probably about 10, 20 miles, and took him to another village. Back then, you had to walk everywhere. Took him to a neighbouring village and my dad survived, except he grew up in this neighbouring village without his family because his mum and dad couldn't leave because they had farm and whatever it is and you couldn't just leave that behind because it wouldn't be there when you come back. So um, he grew up in this village, yeah, with sort of extended relatives, but really on his own, essentially, right? And back those days, you know, having a, a boy was useful because they would go out and work in a farm and that would have been his destiny, work in a farm, not really get educated and that was that. But he really fought to get educated. I mean, he was in a farm one day. He went there early because he knew that there was um, um, someone coming like to enroll people into schools. So he went into like the forest, the farm to like gather firewood, as they would call it back then. And he nearly got shot by a hunter. It was dark and the hunter's thinking they're not going to be a child at this time. So luckily the hunter didn't actually shoot him. My dad did his work. He um, then went to enroll in school. 
He was brilliant. He got into the school, but when he went back to the family's house, they beat the hell out of him because they're thinking, A, why did you get up early and risk your life to go and take firewood and do your chores? And B, what the hell do you mean you're going to school? Like, they just wanted him to work on the farm. Anyway, they let him stay at school. And in the school, there would be a big occasion if there was ever a plane flying overhead, like picture this, it's 1950s Nigeria, right? And for them, the whole school would come out to witness this plane going overhead. And my dad was probably about six, seven at this time. He would look up at the plane and say, um, one day I'm going to be on the white man's plane. I'm going to London and I'm going to be rich. Because obviously, you know, Nigeria is a, was a British colony back then. And everybody's dream was to come to the motherland, just like the Windrush generation from the West Indies was to come to London. Except my dad wanted to come to London and be rich. And when he said that, the whole school would beat him. Teachers, pupils, everyone would beat him because they're thinking, who do you think you are? It's like someone said, I'm going to go go to Mars. Like It was so unlikely. You know, who do you think you are? Small boy. And they'd all beat him and take turns and the teacher would beat him. They'd laugh at him and be, look at you. You don't even have a mother or a father. You have no brothers and sisters. You small fool. But my dad had this weird knack to just be so focused. You know, he excelled in education. Um, you know, grew up, made it out of the village, went to Lagos, which was the capital of Nigeria at the time. And then from Lagos, made it over to London. What age? He would have been about 1920 or something by the time he got to London. And he arrived in one of the worst ghettos that existed in London at the time, a lovely neighbourhood called Notting Hill. People don't realise Notting Hill wasn't Notting Hill back then. It was quite horrific. I mean, it was full of immigrants. You First you had the sort of the Jewish wave, then you had the Portuguese wave, then you had the Irish wave, and then you had the West Indian wave. wave. And we were one of the few African families in a, what was essentially a West Indian neighbourhood. Um, and the houses were horrific. They were so horrific. There was a notorious landlord called, I think it was Daniel Ratchman or something, so bad his name was mentioned in Parliament, and that's why the laws change. So my dad found himself in this dilapidated, dilapidated Victorian building, falling apart, you know, in one room, and he eventually had six kids. But one thing, he was always very proud, and he used to always sort of clean the house. And one day, a guy was showing people around. My dad didn't know who he, who the guy was, and my dad... The guy said to my dad, why is it every time I come here, you're always cleaning the house? My dad was about to, you know, a bit of a chipping shoulder. He was quite small, a bit fiery. And he thought, no, let me just answer this, this guy properly. He said, I love to take care of where I live. So there was another day and this guy came around again and said, why are you always cleaning? And again, my dad suppressed his anger and said, I like to take care of it. So the third time the guy comes around, he goes, I want to tell you who I am. I'm your landlord. And for the last couple of months, I've been trying to sell this property. And I haven't been able to sell it. But every time I come here, you're always looking after the place. So I want to sell it to you. And my dad, obviously an immigrant at that time, God knows what they were earning back then. With kids. He had kids, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if I was born when he bought up. I don't think I was born yet. How so old it are might you? Have been, I'm 49. You're 49? I know, I do. Are you kidding me? That don't crack, isn't it? Fucking I do look young, hell, don't I? Honestly, I, I, I do. I, but I take care of myself as well. I should bring out a skin line or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> 49? But, um, yeah, I'm 49. I think I'm the oldest person that's ever been on The Apprentice, but for some reason, the press has never picked up on it. Wow. But um, so anyway, so this guy ends up selling the house to my dad. Obviously, my dad didn't earn enough, so the guy actually made my dad look like he was working for him to kind of make his um, income yep. come up. Bought the house for, I think it was like, 19 grand or something like that, which, and I adjusted it for inflation. It's about 100 and something, not much. Um, so my dad bought that property. Um, what was he doing for work at this point? He was working for British Rail, I think, which is what a lot of the immigrants yeah. did. You know, they it was all about coming to the motherland because in the 60s, I mean, the UK was on its knees a little bit. Still hadn't recovered from the war, which is why you had the wind rush generation, etc. So everyone came and worked in either the NHS or they worked in London Transport or something like that. And your mum was Nigerian? Yeah, my mum's also, yeah. She she was in the same village. They've known each other since they were about Oh, they came seven. over together? No, he came over first and about a year later or two, once he's established himself, he brought my mum over. Okay. But I just share that story just to show the level of tenacity that I've come from. You know, someone that was beaten as a kid, kept the dream going, absolute poverty. I mean, poverty that you can't even begin to imagine. Like, Nigeria, there's no welfare state. There still isn't a welfare state there to this point. But he came, he bought that house and he just kept buying property. I mean, to the point my mum got scared and said, stop doing it because we grew up poor as a result because every penny he had, he would buy another property, buy another property back when property was cheap. Yep. So you can imagine, I mean, I don't know if you've been to Notting Hill in the last couple of years. It's certainly not the ghetto that it was. So his little investment has paid off big time. And he, he still owns these properties yeah, many yeah, yeah. years he on? Yeah, he still does. Yeah, about 25, well, about 
70 percent of the property that he had he still yeah. owns but that's day. worth millions and millions yeah it's worth millions and millions i mean that's another story which i'll probably share a bit later because um yeah he's he was one of these generations that believes in paying off all your mortgage so he has no mortgage on any of these properties oh, really? but it's not a good thing as you know obviously yeah. as an entrepreneur i mean you want your your assets to be working for you anyway that's a story that we might come to but i share that story just to illustrate my background and how I was brought up because all I've ever known is if you persevere hard enough, success will happen. I mean, to the point of naivety that I believe that. I didn't have this sense of, you know, you grew up, you know, I, I was born in 75. So you grew up in the times when being black was perceived as a disadvantage, but I never felt that. My dad would say to me, you know, you're black, you've got to work three times harder than everyone else. And so I did. I didn't complain about it. So I'm quite used to overworking and you see that probably in The Apprentice, I'm always, always, always pushing. I'm not like just chilling. So, yeah. Tell me, sorry to interrupt, but uh -huh. how, how was that imparted on you as a kid and how did you receive it? And I guess my context of the question is normally, you know, you hear you hear about these stories of of parents, grandparents, you know, et cetera, of, of how, how people behaved typically in different generations. Uh, so, well, you know, let's say materially different time brackets. And if you look at today's world, I guess with things moving a lot faster, I mean, it moves a lot faster now than it did from the 30s to the 50s, 50s to the 70s. But, you know, a, a hardworking parent of, of a 10-year-old, 15-year-old kid today is going to be someone who is, let's say, born in the 80s. That kid born in the mid to, mid to late 2000s is probably laughing at that parent now because, you know, we're in such a materially different world. Mm. And, you know, they kind of... I guess they get lazy and it, and it's like, oh, you know, my dad did this that, and the other, but I, I, I live in a different world. Now, I guess, obviously, you're, um, you're, you're a lot older than I thought you were, so yeah. maybe, maybe that's half the answer to the question. But it's very rare, I find, that these, these immigrant parents, these ultra-hardworking parents who basically, you know, came from nothing and built everything on just gr grit, desperation, desire, yeah. that never gets passed on to the kids. You, you, they, they know that's what the dad was like or the mom was like, but they, you know, they weren't born in Nigeria into poverty. They, yeah. they, they were born in in England, or et cetera, et cetera. No, you're right. Actually, it's almost like comfort breeds um, complacency, isn't mm -hmm. it, to a certain extent? But I think what we benefited uh, be benefited from was the fact that we still grew up quite poor because my dad was sort of asset rich, cash poor. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons for that is because of what my parents experienced, they had this kindness, which is, is probably not the best thing. I oh, God, that sounds horrible me saying it, but I think to be an entrepreneur and be that kind is probably not the best thing. It's a bit like you having a business and giving your customers things for free. What they did was let people live in their properties for free. Because everyone's got a sob story, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't afford to pay the rent, blah, 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 blah. And because my parents struggled, they always had a soft spot for that and people took advantage. So we, we kind of grew up poor because of that. Um, even though we were told we had all of this and all of that, it was still poor. But because we grew up poor, I still had that sense of what my dad had. I didn't have this silver spoon. You know, I went to not the best school. You know, I was around kids who didn't grow up with with fathers, for instance. You know, kids that got into like gang stuff and all the rest of it. How did which you was a good grounding for me because it meant that I really had to work hard for myself in order to make it. You know, I couldn't just rely on my parents. And how did you treat your education or how were you, you made to treat your education by your parents, obviously from a guy who excelled in his education? Mm. Um, you know, it, was, was that something that was pushed onto you that you must go to God, school and you must do hell well? yeah. I mean, in my culture, you wouldn't get away with how I was brought up now. I mean, you'd get beaten to do your maths. You'd get beaten to do your English. You'd get beaten. And I loved it. I don't say that as a complaint. I love the fact that we were beaten. And anyone of my age wherever they're from, an Asian background, maybe maybe an Arab background, certainly an African background, you would have been beaten when it came to discipline and education. And I loved it. It was all I knew, you know, and I, I loved learning, you know. Like we had these um, encyclopedias. I don't know if you remember Encyclopedia Britannica. How do. old are you? I'm 43. But Did I you look bloody good yourself? Saying, <laughs> I look good. I thought you were in your 30s. Bloody hell, you, know, you got the fountain of youth or something in your backyard. <laughs> we, used you to have, we used to have them. We had Encyclopedia Britannica and Kids Encyclopedia. The kids ones were the red the ones. Guys weren't messing around, yeah. And the, and one, the yeah. adults were the black ones. Mm. Yeah. It's funny you said that. I didn't realise that. Yeah. Oh, we had the red ones then. Was it kids? Sure, was that, that was some smart bloody kids then, because that was full of some meaty stuff. I'm pretty sure. I don't it was. think that that was a kids' version, but you could be right. I don't know. 
It was definitely true. I'm going to. It was it. meaty, meaty stuff then for kids because kids won't get that now. I mean, I mean, it's it's mad that the encyclopedias don't even exist. I mean, I know. Now we got Google. Um, it's weird. We got Google, but I mean, this generation seems to have less act or less interest in knowledge than our generation who had to rely on encyclopedias. It's it's kind of weird. I'm pulling them up now. Was it? You might have been right. Actually, was you, it not children's? You can buy Britannica? a full. You can buy a full set of them. On the on eBay for 199 quid. I'm gonna get that dude. Uh, <laughs> do you know what? That was a central part of why I became so fixated on creating something that had a legacy to it. Because I'd look in the encyclopedias and I was I mean fascinated with everything in there from like Galliard and um like think of every inventor you can even think about. Oh wow. Kids oh, like different. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> so I was obsessed with like Newton and um Everyone you can imagine back then, like these people who, you know, Beethoven, for instance, everyone that left a legacy that reverberated through time. It's my favorite phase, um, phrase. And I wanted to be in there. And back then, you didn't really see anyone that looked like you. You know, me growing up as a young black kid in Notting Hill, you weren't in, a, in an environment where you saw people that looked like yourself that did well. And you certainly didn't see that in encyclopedia. There were no historical figures. I mean, it was years later that you learn about kingdoms like Marley and, and people like that. By that time, you just did, I was thinking, one day I want to be in this encyclopedia. Little did I know that Google would make it obsolete, but still at the time. And because my dad had had a dream and he'd made it, like I said, I had this naivety of, I just need to dream it. And it was almost an early form of manifestation. And one of my earliest dreams, because I started to develop a love of music, was I wanted to be on top of the pops. So when you talk about the whole thing around education, yes, it was beaten into me. And I loved it. I loved learning with a... I mean, I would devour any book that I saw, I would devour. Um, and I sort of went away from sort of academia and more into the arts just because I'm in Notting Hill. And, I, you know, if you know about Notting Hill, it's such a cool, creative, arty place. I mean, everyone, I think, has lived there at some moment in time. Jagger, Bowie. So it has, it's got a real musical energy to it. And then you've got the Notting Hill Carnival, which every year just brings out more of that. And growing up in Nigeria, of course, it's like parties, 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 parties every single weekend. So I mean, even from my mother's womb, I was probably dancing and letting my body groove. So I had this massive amount of education. I had this real sense that it was possible because my dad did it. And then I had a love of music growing up in one of the most creative, incredible neighbours of London. And I developed that my first love, which was one day I'm going to be on top of the pops. And so together with my brother, as I got a bit older... I would just devour music wherever I could. I mean, we are too poor to have things like piano, but at school, I'd always play the piano. And I learned to play it by reading guitar tab, which is a very poor way to learn the piano, right? I didn't, we didn't have the luxury of piano lessons, but I learned guitar tabs because it was easier. Guitar tabs didn't have music notes if it was just G minor or A sharp um, chords, whatever it might yeah. be. And so I developed a, a real love of music and a real love of education and you know, obviously, as time went on, you know, I went to university, got a degree in advertising. And I mean, I'm sure we're going to talk a bit more about some of that stuff. But yeah, my dad was definitely my very first hero as far as being a businessman and entrepreneur is concerned. Because for him to come over here absolutely penniless, to invest in property and now to be worth several millions as a black man as well in the UK um, in those days. I mean, come on, I was so blessed. I was so blessed because... Most people don't have that kind of role model, especially young black boys growing up in a working class way. I mean, even to this day, I get stopped every single day, especially by young black guys, because they watch me on The Apprentice and they're just so proud of me. And that blows me away because I forget that not everyone looks at life like me. I just, I have this naivety of, if you dream it, you can do it. But other people almost sometimes need to see someone that looks like them, that they can relate to, and then it's more possible. And I love the fact that they have that because I'm a mentor and I want to be someone that shows people that anything's possible. I think sometimes people get this message of, especially in today's society, I'm just like, there are lots of reasons why you can't make it. And I get it. You know, I think the days of my dad doing what he's done is gone. You're not going to invest in property and make that kind of money anymore. Mm -hmm. And there isn't much of that. I mean, the last sort of gold rush like that might have been, say, the cryptocurrency gold rush, which I really got into. But, I also but it's kind of gone a little bit. But there are always opportunities out there, you know. But I also think the people, you know, we, we always talk about these stories where someone bought a property for, you know, 10 grand and it's worth four, yeah. 400 grand, you know, 30 years yeah. later, 40 years later. And we say, oh, you know, those opportunities to make money aren't available anymore. 
but I also think most of the people who tell those stories, they're not really entrepreneurs or business True, people. Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Different for your daddy who's yeah, trying to yeah, build up a business. Yeah. But these are just people who who bought an asset because he wanted to live in it and time and compound interest yeah, ran, yeah, you know, yeah. ran, ran its course. So it's almost not a business model that you should be pissed off. It pissed off is not available to you anymore yeah. anyway. And and yes. Uh, everything you can win in one hand and lose in the other. Yes, there isn't the chance to buy a property and let it compound over forty years anymore. But yeah. what there is the chance now, which was never there, is the chance. Let's say the internet to reach the entire oh world. Oh my god, that's what I was going to say. In one exactly. minute, exactly. In in many ways, yeah, the property door might have closed for some. Although there still are some really good property strategies like rent to rent and other things. Where I know people have made an absolute fortune. But I think young people do have opportunities. My dad would only have dreamed of. You know, you take someone like. Um, I know people don't necessarily like her, but she's an entrepreneur, whether you like her or not. Kim Kardashian. Mm -hmm. I mean, God, does she monetize just this. She's almost monetized selfies to a certain extent. Well, because she's monetized the oxygen of eyeballs. I mean, I mean she's it's, taking it's, it and it's, run with it. It's brand. Yeah. It's it's distribution. Yeah. And and it's you know, it's monetization of those yeah. you know, th three, I guess, three principles which every successful business has, but she has been able to do it at absolute scale, at be, be, scale because of yeah. the internet, because of social media, because of reality TV, things that didn't exist 40 years ago. Exactly. And I'm sure in another 40 years' time will be, you know, some will be going, oh, social media, it's that's completely dead now. We don't have the chances yeah, exactly. Kim Kardashian had. But there's but always another something. Opportunity. Exactly. And I think what you said is very key. I think one of the ways to do that is to surround yourself with people who speak how we're speaking, because I'm always speaking from a glass half full point of view. There's always opportunities out there. They are always, always. So when these young lads who come up to me and say, Trey, well done on The Apprentice. You've inspired me, blah, blah, blah. I always talk to them. What are you doing? What's going on? I had this one lad in the gym the other day saying, oh my God, you're such an inspiration. It's so good to see someone that looks like me do so well, because you don't always get someone necessarily on TV who speaks eloquently, speaks well, but they're still cool. You know, they're either kind of like rappers and they, they don't necessarily sound educated, although they are, but they don't speak that way. And sometimes I don't like that. I want to see more nerds on TV, more black nerds and more black businessmen, because you don't have to speak in a certain way or dress a certain way. You can be smart and you can speak eloquently and you can speak about interest rates, what we're speaking about, and still be cool. But I don't like this cool thing of you've got to be a certain way in order to make it and you've got to be a rapper or something to make it. But be a nerd, be a CEO. But tell me, so we've mentioned the black thing a few times, you know, the black, yeah, uh, yeah. black, black uh, nerd, you know, black man with yeah. lack of opportunities. How much, though, do you think people who either don't know the right path to go down or just want to make excuses, use the black thing as an excuse. And I, and oh, I, I, you're getting controversial. <laughs> I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you're it a bit, cancelled a bit of extra caveat. So I, I've I, got a big mouth. I'll answer it. I, I had a, um, a podcast re semi-recently with, with a footballer. Yeah. And he he's, a, he's an ex-footballer now, want, want, wants to work in football management. But he was giving me a, a big talk about how um, black black footballers or black people in football management that they can't get jobs and and that, and that you know there's almost like a conspiracy that no that they're never going to have black football managers so so we don't bother trying you know so we don't bother doing our exams yeah. i'm saying but you're making it a, a self-fulfilling prophecy you know I, I think you know if if you if you ultimately believe that then then you're never going to try and you, and you and you're going to let them win you know like to, to me you're you're making an excuse uh and you know i don't know if, the, if those two parallels are sitting together but you know how much of these people are just saying oh i haven't achieved what i want and it's because i'm black I think both points of view are right, right? There are some people who will make excuses of whatever their perceived um, lack might be, whether it's black, gender, um, sexuality, whatever it might be. True, 100%. Yeah, I can't climb the career ladder because I'm a woman. True. But one thing I know, and I, I, it's funny, I was speaking to a good friend of mine, um, and I won't name any, any names here, who's very entrenched in the football world. There is still an old boys network that's male, pale and stale, as they say, that does genuinely want to promote each other. I mean, do you remember the days where even just being a black football player wasn't possible? There were days like that. Or you look at the NBA, there was, you know, you had the coloured league and you had the, the, the normal M league. So it was a time where the perception was, you know, black people are too lazy to play football. And then once they got that chance, the floodgates open, right? I think that's still there with management levels because maybe, I don't know why, because I'm not necessarily like a football aficionado, but I think there is a perceived sense of, you might have been good as a player, but there's a certain intellect or understanding that it takes to be a manager and I, I think there is a glass ceiling to be broken so when people are saying that I do know firsthand that there are barriers I think would be naive to think that 
we're living in this egalitarian society and everyone's holding hands singing Kumbaya and there's equal opportunities for everyone. That's not true. Mm -hmm. There really isn't true. And I don't think the barriers are always necessarily even just colour based. Sometimes it's class based. You know, someone like me, I'm lucky, even I didn't necessarily go to the best educational establishments because of my background. I speak very, very well where you wouldn't know any different. But someone who doesn't speak well or is easily intimidated in an environment where nobody looks like them and they seemingly are more connected than they are, you all get intimidated and you might give up. That's true. And it's understandable. I completely get when guys come up to me and look at me as a role model and I instill that confidence in them because they are in a world where they think their colour is an impact. Because if you think it, you will operate like that and it is true and, and that's the thing you know if you and i if you and i especially we didn't open our mouths and we went to go and i don't know it's from a credibility point if you went to a conference or something you might be perceived in a suit as more credible than me mm -hmm. that's just a fact of life and it happens everywhere if i go to nigeria i'm going to be perceived as less than because of my hair my parents hate my hair by the way than a nigerian guy black just like me but it's got nice neat hair and he's just so human beings are always evaluating people based on the way they look. So it's true. I don't think people are just making up excuses. No, I, I it is true. But I think the danger is when you have a society, and it happens sometimes, where it's always ramped home, because you're this, it's going to be harder for you. I hate that message. Yeah. Because I look at the opposite. I think because I'm black, it gives me an advantage. Most people wouldn't say that. I think if I was with you, and yeah, you might have the advantage over me just to look at visually, and we both didn't open up our mouth. The minute I speak, I'm going to be more memorable than you. Because there's going to be more people like you than me. Someone's going to be like, oh, he's, he's different. Oh, he's charismatic. He speaks well. And that's how I see myself. My colour is my biggest asset. I love it. But you have to teach people that because society teaches people are, you know, if you're black, you're like to get this. Da, 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 da. And I want to change that because the entrepreneurial spirit that's in the black community is massive. I go to a lot of self-development and business type stuff and it's full of young black people wanting to get ahead. And they should be given those chances because so many of them are brilliant. I mean, even some of the people that I grew up around on the street who were complete wrong -uns, don't get me wrong, and, you know, use their skill to be selling dodgy powders that shouldn't have been. If you put them in the boardroom, them same skills, they would excel. Because if I look at big companies like, I don't know, sugar companies or massive ones, they didn't actually start off life in the best way. I mean, look at the... East India Company, or one of some of these companies, they were drug dealers, essentially. I mean, come look at the opium wars against China. It's the same thing. It's the same skill set. It's the same ruthlessness. But these young kids over in the UK or the States, they don't always get a chance. You know, look at Jay-Z. He went from selling drugs in the Marcy projects to now being worth, what, 2.5 billion? It's the same skill set, 50 cents. The same hustling skill set took him from selling drugs to now doing one of the biggest deals with Stars, the production company. So there is something of truth around people not getting those opportunities. But I think individuals have a responsibility to ignore those things. And like me, work three times hard if you need to, because there's no point me complaining that the world won't give me what I need. I'm gonna go out there and take it. Do you understand? No, absolutely. And, and so in that sense, you're right. And it frustrates me that people have these limiting beliefs. And it is a limiting belief of, because I'm X, why is not possible for me? Yeah, that's, I want to change uh, that. So I, I was going to say, obviously, yeah, we've, we've spoken about it in, in the context of yeah. black, but you know, you can substitute that black word for for poor, for uneducated, yeah, for, for women, female, for, 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 for whatever. You know, True. If, if you yeah. want to find an excuse, if you want to be a negative, yeah, I'm yeah. not saying the world is an equal yeah. and perfect place, but you know, for, for every person who prefers a man, someone prefers a woman. For everyone who wants True. a black person, yeah. someone wants a white person. I, but you've got to be hungry, entrepreneurial, you motivated, have to be and driven, hungry, and don't I, let everybody. But you else... know what's the crazy thing, and this is what I, I when I. I coach people, I call it pain juice, right? There is something about the pain of things being harder that gives you an advantage. You must have known that. I mean, you're, I imagine you're from a background where you weren't given a silver spoon and you had to work for everything you've got, so right? I, I was, I, so I actually, I actually grew up, grew up in a, you know, a, a well-to-do background. My, okay. my, my old man had his own business. Yeah. Uh, you know, he didn't, didn't make gazillion. I mean, he sold that business when I was 18 and, and got good money. But as a, as a child, he was, he was a good six figure earner. I went to private school. I oh, never, you did? I oh, never okay. wanted for anything, yeah. but at the same token, I wanted so much more. So, so you, where did that come from? Where did that grit and determination from your point of view come from? Because I think people who come from nothing they have a sense of i need to get a hell out of dodge i'm going to do whatever it takes and i always think it seems a bit harder for people who've come from something so where did that come from for you i i, I think maybe you know maybe it's because i had enough money 
to see bigger money, if that makes sense. Ah, and, okay. and, and, and even even though my dad was an entrepreneur, my parents were entrepreneurial, they, they'd come from nothing. I mean, but, but both of them were from absolute yeah. council yeah. estate backgrounds. So we went to nice holidays. We'd stay in five-star hotels, but we were probably the, we were probably the poorest people in the five-star yeah. hotel. And I'd look at the super rich people, and even though like even though my, pet, my dad had money and he'd been successful, they still very much had the mindset of, oh, you know, you'll never get that much money or, you know, that, that that's almost like more money than sense. And I was very yeah. inquisitive about so that. So you've benefited like me, having a parent that struggled and you've got a sense of that from them. I mean, actually, my, my dad had come to see me in, in, in Dubai the other week, actually, and um, um, and we were ha having this conversation the next day because we'd had dinner in my house and a friend of mine had come around, guys worth Thick, thick end of a billion. Wow. Um, and the next day, my dad was asking me about him, talk, talking a, a couple of questions. He said, but, you know, you wouldn't want that. And why would you, you know, and for always like finding finding negative reasons why you wouldn't want it. But then I think ultimately for me, those negative reasons are just because you want to make an excuse for why you've not, why yeah, you've not got yeah, it. Yeah. You, know, as, you know, as I look at them and say, oh, listen, I want to learn from him. I want to be him. And maybe I'm not going to get a billion, but if I shoot for a billion, so you I might get 200 mindset, million, yeah. you know? Yeah, and I think that mindset, and it's interesting that your dad has that because then it gives you something to almost not fight against, but to excel over because my dad's very similar. Even though he's done well, some of the things that they do shock me. God, I don't want to say it on a podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> my parents are very into conserving money. And I'm not saying he's not generous, but they'll do things like, it sounds a bit shocking to say that, it sounds a bit embarrassing, but who cares? They will do things like save a tea bag sometimes to reuse it. And that's the hangover they've got from being very, very poor. Like I said, mm -hmm. there are certain things that they do that to me makes me think, you guys are like easily probably in the top 10% of this country, which is not much, by the way. People think top 10% you need to be a gazillionaire. You don't need to be that wealthy. So why do you do things like that? So when I see that, it almost does my head and it makes me think, I want to do more. I want to do more. I've always had this ambition to be richer than my dad, for instance, right? But... um. Yeah, going back to what you said, I think there, there, there needs to be some sort of catalyst that you see, often it comes from your parent, that wants you to do well, that's bigger than the perception that society is going to hold you back. And most people don't have that. I think that's hard for most people to get over. They think, this is what's possible for me, and I'm not going to be able to excel over this. And one of the most important things is the environment. Like You're clearly surrounded by people who are doing well, someone who's like nearly a billionaire, and it forces you to up your game. Most people are not. Most people are in environments that are pulling them down constantly and they don't even realise it. They're not in a conversation of plenty. They're in a conversation of lack. And do you find that even though your father is is wealthy, is successful, that it, he'll look at some of the things that you're doing and say, you're crazy, you're taking too much risk. Oh, you know, my God. You, know, you shouldn't be doing this, you should be slowing down. Dude, let me tell you the story of when we um, got into the music business, right? How, so old, how, how old are you at this point? I would have been... So I went uni... Uh, I went uni to actually save time, actually, because I had to. I've been my parents because I'm not doing anything. But um, I would have been 23-ish, right, this time. But I've always been doing music from the age of about 12 or something like that. Um, but in our culture, you have to be a doctor, a lawyer, maybe an engineer or a businessman. That's it. Four. No more. No more. They don't want to hear anything but that. So picture my parents when I say to them, with my brother Ashley, oh, we're making music. Horrified. You know, yeah. like, what do you mean? What? What, what is music? Because from their Nigerian cultural background, musicians and vagabonds and, you know, they're just not going to amount to anything, which is kind of true. If you're in Nigeria, what are you going to do with music? There's no industry. You better become a doctor because it's guaranteed. You can go anywhere in the world. So, you know, our first big hit record was The Boy Is Mine, the um, garage mix of it. Okay. You probably danced to that. You might not remember. No, I, I, it. That and was the, our the best boys record. Mine, as in like a remix of, the, of Brandy, Brandy and Monica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was our I think that's the best record I'm we've old ever made. To know Brandy oh, you Monica. know that, right? I mean, that was phenomenal. We probably shifted about fifty thousand or more white labels because it was a bootleg. Okay. It's not that we saw the money from it, but we didn't care because I was it wasn't about to say back, back then we're talking music 20, 25 years ago. Very different world. Yeah, different streaming. world. Oh were my you god. Making, were you making good money then? Oh my. I mean, it depends on the deal you do, obviously, because it was. It made more money to the music industry, but in the naivety of what you're signing, you're getting a tiny fraction of that. Whereas now, obviously, people are a bit clever. But um, so we did that. Tell my parents, oh, my God, look, we've made this song. And this song is blowing up everywhere. And we're selling tons of units. And mum and dad are looking at us like, what is this? Get a proper job. Get a proper job. <laughs> exactly. And then my older brother, who's like four or five years older than me, he's getting smashed. Why are you leading your young brother astray? He's going to university. Why are you getting him to do music? So that, two years that, that was your, your, your music partner? Yeah, Ashley, yeah. 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 Well, I'll talk about it a bit. I'll try not to blub when I talk about Ashley because it's a bit <laughs> difficult. But 
it just I, I love my brother to the moon and back but anyway two years after that we then do body groove obviously you're signing big deals and blah 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 you know you're you've got like i don't know 100 grand quarter of a million in your bank or whatever it is and at that point my parents still thinking what is this it's only when we took some of that money and bought property that they thought I always knew you would make it in music. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you bloody hypocrites. You hate the football making music. But from their point of view, and you can understand, they're thinking music is not going to give you a career. It's only when they see the money and that you've invested it, because a lot of people who were making UK Garage back then, they were buying cars and clubs and women and jewellery, all the kind of stuff that's going to depreciate and turn into dust. Whereas because of my upbringing and all I've ever known is property, if you've got money, buy property, you've got money, invest it. I did that, and it was only then that action that my parents were then proud. So, did you buy that property with Ashley? Did you buy it yourself? No, I bought my bought myself. What did you buy? Um, oh god, I don't want to talk about that too much on the bloody podcast. But yeah, you know your your one beds and your studios and your typical rental stuff that you would you yeah, buy. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, you couldn't buy like a house in London even then, the year two thousand. But but, but, but you were buying it from an investment perspective, from, purely from an investment yeah, yeah. point of view. So my whole family are landlords. Every single one yeah. of us um, are landlords. It's just been drummed into us. And I always know that something is, most things are short lived. So yeah, you might be doing well in the music business now, but that's going to be gone tomorrow. You know, not, most people are not going to be the bloody Beatles or the yep. Rolling Stones. You're going to have two, three, four years maximum, whatever you make, invest it, because that way you're getting paid again and again and yep. again. And I've always been a massive fan of um, passive income. And one of the reasons was my health, which we haven't touched on yet. But because I couldn't always rely on my health, I knew I had to create passive income streams in case I was too sick to work. And there were times when I was really too sick. So I've never actually had a nine to five job or a normal job in my life ever, because I've gone straight from university into the music business, then into property and pretty much just hustled ever since then. And I've, ne I've, I've always avoided the thought of having a nine to five job. It just makes me feel nauseous, the thought of going into work every single day, you know? So talk, talk to me about your, your illness and your sickness. When, when did that happen? So that happened when I was 15. That was 1990, February the 25th. I think that date's just ingrained in my memory. A couple of days prior to that, I had abdominal pains. Um, I was then rushed to hospital, um, had appendicitis. I had to have an emergency surgery. All went fine, all brilliant. Then about a day after recovering from that, around the 25th, it was a couple of days after Mandela came. I always, that was my last memory. And I say that because it was the last memory I had of being normal. And I explain what I mean when I say normal, right? So um, a couple of days after the operation, I was given a drug called Stematil. It's an anti-emetic. It stops you vomiting. And I had a, what is called an ocular gyric crisis, which is a, a rare allergic reaction to the drug Stematil which basically means you kind of, your eyes roll back in your head and you're stiff. So, I mean, I'm on a hospital bed and I can see the wall behind me clearly and nothing else. That's how violent it is. And I say it's paralysis, but it's actually worse than that. It's a spasm and a spasm's worse than paralysis. Paralysis is when your body goes limp, spasm when you're locked mm. in. And as a kid, I was always scared of in, in closed space. I was claustrophobic, right? Severely claustrophobic. I couldn't get into a lift as a kid. And it doesn't get more claustrophobic than being locked in your own body. Now that is the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced in my life to the present day. So they gave me the um, antidote for that drug, a drug called benzotropin. I sound like a doctor because I had to become a doctor. You're awake, you're awake, you're fully, yeah, I'm awake you know exactly happens. what's going on. I know exactly on. what's going on. I'm locked in my body. I can only move my eyeballs a little bit. And the first time this happened, the nurse and doctor seemed all right. So I didn't panic that much. I'm thinking if they seem chilled, I'm all right. So they gave me this antidote called benzotropin. About 30 minutes later, my body starts to unlock itself. And I'm thinking, thank God, I don't want to go through that again. Um, then about an hour later, I feel my body going into the same sort of rigor mortis type thing. And this time now the doctors are panicking and they're thinking we've just get a 15 year old boy, right? Yeah. We've given him the antidote, what the hell's going on? And I am panicking now, but I'm tra trapped in my body. My mum and dad are panicking like, what is going on? And obviously, you know, with them not necessarily being born in the UK, you know, had that happened to my child, I probably would ask certain questions, but they didn't have that. And I don't blame them for that. But I got locked into my body again and I'm thinking this is it. And, and I learned all of this years later that what, when that happened, my body went into a severe form of trauma, a severe form of PTSD. And what your body does when that happens, it tries to disassociate you from the trauma. So when I came out of the second paralysis, after they gave me massive doses of the antidote, my world had changed. And it's never been the same since. I had a ringing in my ears that wasn't there beforehand. The world looked like it was unreal, like, like I was dreaming. And I had this pressure sensation at the back of my head. And the medical staff were saying to my mum and dad, 
don't worry, it's just the effect of the drugs. After a few days, it'll go back to normal. And I'm terrified at this point, terrified that I'm going to go back into mm. this rigor mortis spasm thing, but also terrified thinking, do I have to live with these conditions? I'm not going to cope with this. But I said, don't worry, he'll be fine. But I was never fine. When you say you were never fine, you mean today you're still today, never fine? Today I still have two of those three things, right? So I've come out of the hospital trying to get on with life and all these symptoms are progressively getting worse. Slowly, but progressively worse every day. So it feels like I'm in a dream. I've got this faint ringing in my ears and at that time I could only hear it when I was about trying to sleep. And I've got this pressure sensation. That was the worst one. So fast forward, obviously, age 15, you know, I think 21, I went to university, had our massive hit, had body groove, you know, was living a dream, was on top of the pops with all these other pop stars who I always admired. Life should have been great, right? Except my life was one day I'm living the best of life on top of the pops and oh my God, all my childhood dreams have come true. And the next time I'm at um, another hospital having my 10th MRI scan or my 15th CT scan. like Because you had another attack or just because... No, because, because I wanted because dancers. Always... I wasn't well. I had this yeah. head pressure and it was so bad that I would get... Um, the neurologist would say to me after I've had the brain scan, good news, really, really good news. There's nothing wrong with you. We've found nothing on towards in your skull, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, I'm crying my eyes up thinking... Tell me I've got a brain tumour. Yeah. Would you could you want answers, yeah, yeah, right? You want to know, yeah. So that was my life. It was, it was just, I, I almost don't know how I got for it, but I've just got this level of resilience and tenacity that no matter how bad life gets, and I'll carry on. But the way I coped with it towards the end was try at least you know you can jump off a building, you can kill yourself basically if it gets bad. It's like the same sort of rationale people have when they go to dignitas. They're not suicidal, they're pragmatic. So I had this pragmatic view of my health gets bad, I can always kill myself. But I love life. Was that was that a genuine consideration? Or? Yeah, genuine, yeah. Because it was getting bad. It took years. In fact, it took 18 years before it got to the point of, like, really, really bad. And life was... And it wasn't every day my life was hell. You know, I got on with life and got used to it, but there were just times when it became hell. Because every couple of months, it would ramp up a notch. Mainly the head pressure was the hardest one to deal with like it would just ramp up a notch. And it was almost like, imagine I tied a vice around your head and every couple of months I turned the screw a bit more. So I'd wake up and it's turned and I'm like, getting to the point where you can't cope. You just, it, it's horrific. It's like, I don't know, having multiple sclerosis or any of these kind of conditions where people go to Dignitas. Um, you just get to the point, you just get fed up. So it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Obviously tinnitus, which I now know what it was. I didn't know what it was was being made worse by loud music. But yeah. it happened at 15, and I was a noise addict. And because it happened after the hospital, I didn't relate it to loud music. Yeah, it's foolish now, but at the time I didn't know. So obviously I'm in a studio all the time, body groove, and then the worst thing I could have done after that was become a DJ, because now you're really in the environment. So I was waking up every day, and my tinnitus is getting worse. So fast forward 18 years after that episode, by that time I would have been 33, I believe, and it would have been 2008. I hope my maths is right. I think it is roughly... 2008, I'm 33. I go and DJ in this um, club, not far from me actually, a club called Sugar Heart in Fulham. I remember that. You remember Sugar Heart? Yeah. yeah. So I've turned up there and the normal club speakers have gone. They've got these stack of speakers by behind the DJ deck. By then I knew what um, tinnitus was. I didn't know what the dream sensation was. I didn't know what the head pressure was. But I knew tinnitus was. I remember thinking, this is probably not a good idea, Trey. But I had a sense of doesn't matter you're not going to be alive anyway in a couple of years who cares if you screw your ears up because i'd become to the point it was so bad that i thought you're probably gonna to have to jump off a building at some point or you're just gonna go mad so either way it doesn't matter so i dj'd there um but i noticed the bongo player had like earplugs in and i think that saved me a little bit because i thought let me go and stuff some tissues to my ears so i've dj'd there i've hung around the bloody managers giving me drinks and whatever stayed a bit longer than i should, probably should have in front of these speakers i went home the next day i woke up i was deaf both my, ears. Both ears. And my tinnitus, which was probably about a nine out of 10 in terms of severity, was now 20 out of 10 in terms of severity. And I was deaf. I mean, that's torture. Mm -hmm. So I've got extreme tinnitus. I'm deaf and I've got head pressure that feels like I need to scratch my head open and get some release. And I'm like, Trey, you finally got to the point of you might have to jump off a building. But the thing is, I was quite religious and spiritual at the time. I had a real strong sense of belief in God. Um, and I'm Catholic. You know what? being Catholic, mm -hmm. like you can't top yourself if you're Catholic. It's like, you know, then I've got my parents and I thought I can't do that to them either. You know, no parent wants to lose um, their, their child, which they did have to face a couple of years after that, don't get me wrong. Um, so I'm like, Trey, you're too powerful. You, you have faith and belief in God. You're gonna have to really dig deep and trust that there's a reason for this. 
So I got back on the internet. Bear in mind, it's 2008. So I've been, we had no internet in 1990, but yep. whenever I could, I was trying to search and find answers. So I said, I'm not coming off the internet till I found answers. And I was trawling, 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 trawling. And I remember someone's blog, I think it was called Star Child, some woman, and she was describing um, her life. And she goes, my life is hell, it's torture. I have um, derealization, depersonalization disorder. And it's the very first time someone described how I felt and had the name for it. Bear in mind, every bloody doctor that I'd seen, I mean, mm. I've been around the world trying to get answers for this thing. So I Googled it and I said, wow, it's exactly what I've got. So I, re I realized it's actually a PTSD from extreme stress. What your body does is dis dissociate you from trauma. It's like when someone's been attacked, they said it felt like it was happening to someone mm. else and I was out of my body watching. Your body does that when you go through so much trauma that you can't handle it. Your body's almost saying, I'm going to take you away from the trauma. And when it's safe to put you back in, I'm going to put you back in. But my body never put me back in because the new trauma became the sensations. I figured all of this out because I had to become almost an expert in the mind because no doctor could tell me. So I figured it all out. I went and saw a professor in, I um, can't remember what the place was. And he said, Trey, you are absolutely spot on. It's exactly what happened to you. And you do have this dissociation, depersonalization, derealization disorder. And because I knew that's what I had, I knew that the tinnitus was caused by stress because tinnitus can be stress induced. Yep. And the head pressure was this extreme reaction to being locked in. There was a part of my body that was always tense. And in this case, it was my head. And because I knew that, I thought, okay, if it's an anxiety type disorder, I can treat it like you would any anxiety. And I didn't obviously want to do pills because I've been on every pill and medication you can imagine. None of that worked. So I thought, let me just deal with it by deep breathing, meditation, because I realized my amygdala which is part of your fight or flight system in your limbic system, was so, so high and it stayed high because I'm always waiting for when I'm going to get paralyzed again that I had to dial it down. And I did that by really reaching within. I know I'm being a bit probably like um, um, <laughs> hippie when I'm talking to you like this, but I, th yeah. this was the truth, right? So I did tons of meditation, tons of self-work, tons of it. And like a miracle within about three weeks, the head pressure disappeared. It was crazy. It was, it's crazy. I mean, I was in floods of tears for this time because this was something I thought I had to live with that I'd have to top myself over. And I found an answer and one of the worst symptoms I reversed. And what was good about that, and that's why I talk about pain is power. What was good about that, I learned that if I can do that, everyone can. And it's what really made me become a, a mentor. Because it, it, for me, it felt like the reason why I'd gone through all that suffering, because it's rare what I deal with, it's like so rare that it happens, probably one in a billion. I thought, I've been given this for a reason. I'm going to teach others how no matter what they deal with in life, they can actually overcome it. And in fact, the bad things that you, can't, you go through are the best things that could ever happen to you. So my pain was a blessing. And people always ask me to this day, Trey, how do you cut your tinnitus? Because it is still quite bad. And I say to them, it's a gift. If I hear this ringing in my ears, I can hear my tinnitus now 10 mm -hmm. times louder than your voice especially in this quiet room, a really? hundred times. Like it's so loud. But whereas before I used to relate to it as a foe and go to a &E because I'll just go deaf and it still happens to me, I'll just go deaf in one ears as you do. I now listen to it and think it's okay. And I actually talk to my amygdala and it sounds weird. I call her Amy and I talk to Amy and say, Amy, it's cool. Because that's what it is. Most of the time we've got a voice in the head and it's the voice that's panicking, not you. We're capable of anything. But it's the voice that says, oh my God, you know, we're not going to cope. Oh my God, you're deaf. Or, oh my God, they're going to laugh at you. Oh my God, it's the voice. But if you learn to speak to that voice or Amy in a way where, Amy, it's cool, I got it. Do you know what I mean? It's just part of your, your body. It's part of your limbic system. It's part of your flight or flight mechanism. I use that all the time to chill myself out. And I train other people to do the same. So I don't have the head pressure, but I still do have severe tinnitus. I still have severe derealization. I do have no idea what it's like to look at the world normal. The last time I had that, I was 15 years old in February, 1990. I have no idea what silence sounds like. Again, I was 15, 1990, the last time I heard silence, but suffering only comes from what you make it mean. And I don't make it mean anything now. It's a bit like what we said about, you know, your skin color, whatever it yeah. is. It's the meaning you give it, not the reality. It's just the meaning, right? I choose to make my color mean something powerful. And so I am. I choose to make my health conditions mean something powerful. And so I am. So I've learned to be very powerful. And that's why as a mentor now, I'm able to transform thousands of lives because I'm not interested in what you've gone through. I'm interested in what you're capable of. And everyone is capable of greatness despite your circumstances. I truly believe that. And almost everyone that we revere in society today has been through hell, whether it's Mandela, whether it's Gandhi. Most people that you see that are very powerful have been through some sort of trauma, Oprah. Just look at people's stories. It's their stories. It's the pain that they've gone through that's made them powerful. Well, I want to talk about 
mentorship and you being a mentor. But I think one more piece of context we, we probably need to add to that, I would guess, is uh, is the passing of your brother. Um, oh, God. So don't want to don't uh, bring out the tears, but... Um... No, I'm fine. I think real men cry. <laughs> That's one thing. I always um, coach a lot of men, and men are so stuck in this sense of what masculinity looks like. But real men cry because it's, it's just an authentic... And response to life itself, and and my brother's death was horrific for me. You know, how how did it come about? So, oh my god, I'm not going to start blubbing. I already blubbed yesterday when I was talking to a journalist. Um, I basically got a call from my dad. I was on the way back from my gym with my missus, and my dad called me. And my dad's your typical Nigerian masculine man, no emotion, all that stuff. And he called me, and he's in tears, and he's saying your brother is gone. Take take a break. Take all the time you want, mate. You know the hard part is about that is, is that the hard part is not just my brother dying. It's my dad crying. And it wasn't like he said your brother's dead. He said your brother is gone. And to not hear your dad cry and use those words, it's weird to say, when someone's died, your brother is gone. Because I'm kind of thinking, gone where? And there's a chance, okay, if he's gone somewhere, I can see him. But I knew what he meant. I had this sense of um, that my brother wasn't going to survive. I knew something would happen, especially when you kind of, this was early, early, early COVID days, um, February 2020. And um, I just thought, my brother smoked, he had asthma. Um, he was a single man. Um and I explain why those, I mean, obviously some of those factors you're aware of, but being a single man is actually quite dangerous for men because men don't take their health that seriously. Um, so when my dad said it, part of me was expecting it, but I just, I was on a little scooter at the time and I broke down and couldn't even speak to my dad and my um, my partner in us took the phone and she was speaking to my dad and I, I just, I was just in my own world thinking, tell me you, time goes slowly and you don't know what the hell's going on um and then i thought to myself just go to his house because if he's gone you can still see him <sighs> it's crazy losing a sibling i don't know how my dad did it and he he was he was sick at the time, or this just this came out of nowhere. So I've gone to the house. Um, there's like police and there's ambulance outside my brother's house, and my other brother I hadn't seen for ages was there, and he was just so distraught. And I could see in his face, and obviously you know it's true. But I run up the stairs um to his flat, and I'm saying to the police, "Can I just see my brother?" And he'd fallen down the stairs, and he might have been there for a couple of days, maybe up to six days. Cause that's the last time anyone um spoke to him. Because he wasn't really around the family. He'd become a little bit estranged from the family. Um, and I remember saying to the police, okay, I know, I get what you're saying, but can I at least just talk to him? And then you can take him away. Like, it's, and it's absurd, but your brain is not in reality in that point. I thought, let me at least speak to him and then he can die. Let me just mm. tell him I love him or hug him. And and the policeman said to, him, to me, you don't want to see him like this. Um, obviously, could he've been there for a couple of days, you know, um, and fallen down the stairs. But by all accounts, he was basically ill about the week before. He said it to my brother, um, or a couple of weeks, actually, he was ill. He was so unwell that he couldn't walk from where we're sat to that door without not being able to breathe. I mean, that's ill, ill. But him being how he was, he wasn't someone that necessarily looked after himself, looked after his health. He didn't have a partner that would drag him to A&E or something. He just went to the um, doctors. The doctors gave him some antibiotics. Who the hell gives someone antibiotics for what's clearly a viral type condition? But like I say, it was early. People hadn't thought about COVID fully. It was about a month before COVID really kicked in. Um, and he was just unwell before that, you know, for two or three weeks before. And he was vomiting. I mean, I got this all from my brother afterwards. He was vomiting. He was clearly unwell. Um, he had vomited on the train. Like All sorts of stuff was going on with his health. And I wish I'd had known and spoke to him because of my background, I was always in and out of hospitals and, and A&E and God knows what. I'd almost trained myself to become a doctor so I would have spotted there was something seriously wrong with him. Um, But, you know, it is what it is. You know, I think on the morning, he must have woken up one morning and thought, wow, this is more serious than I thought and probably then decided, right, let me get myself down to A&E or do something. 
But he ran out of time. He got to the top of his stairs and fell down the stairs. And the police found him with his clothes on, with an umbrella, just about to go out, but didn't make it. And an interesting thing that I, um, where I sh- and the reason why I share this story is, as hard as it is, is because I really want other people to, A, look at their health, that's obvious. But I really want people to not take tomorrow for granted. You know, my brother thought he would have had a tomorrow and he thought, let me put my clothes on. Clearly it's worse than I thought. Let me get myself to the hospital. And he ran out of time. But the police said something interesting. They said, um, um, your brother's got mail and inside the mail there's a passport. Um, and it turned out that my brother um, had got excited by music again because for many years, um, his experience when we made Body Groove and everything was pretty traumatic for him. In fact, for everyone involved, to be fair. Um, and he just, yeah, he, he wasn't... I think after making Body Groove, he really went into a slump and it lasted for 20 years. He he almost came... Not, he wasn't depressed, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to paint that picture, but um, he wasn't excited by music, but he did get excited a couple of months before he passed away. He's working with this friend of ours, a singer called Crystal, and he's excited again. And that passport was what he was going to use to go to New York and shoot the video for a song called Running On The Spot. Um, but of course, he didn't make it. He never got the passport, never went to New York, never shot the video for Running On The Spot. Had he um, made the song running? He'd on the made spot? the song. Yeah, he'd made the song with Crystal, but he never got to fulfill on on that dream of you know getting back into music and being excited by it again. And I remember sharing that story in this personal development event that I was at about two hundred people, and I got on stage, you know, holding back the tears like I was just now, and saying to people, and I told them that story. You know, my brother was unwell for a couple of weeks, and by the time he took it seriously. He didn't make it out of the door. And on this other side of the door, there was a passport and he didn't make it to um, New York. And all of you people sat in the audience whinging about your parents or whinging about life or talking about poor me, you better get complete with that stuff because tomorrow's not guaranteed. You better call your loved ones because it was like a seminar, personal development set, a seminar. And one of the things they invited people to do was to call their loved ones and make peace or say they're sorry or acknowledge your parents, all of that stuff. I said, you guys stop messing about. Tell your parents you love them. Tell your siblings you love them. If you've got a dream, go out and do it. I don't care if you fail, go and do it. Because my brother never got to get that passport and go um, and fulfill on his dream that he wanted to do. But one thing I'm glad that my brother did do is that we made Body Groove. And even though he's gone, people are dancing to that record. That's why I love that song even more now, because people don't realise that that's my brother's record on the song. Because if you watch the video, he so hated the idea of fame, we had to get someone else to come and do it. They asked my brother to be on the video and obviously do his part. He didn't want to do it. They asked me and I wasn't really into fame either. So I passed on it. So we had to get someone, a guy called MC Splash, and he did the video. And to this day, people do not know that Ashley's voice is on, on Body Groove. It's his voice. Made the body move. That's Ashley's voice. And that's the last I've got of him. And even when I performed the song, which is rare, the reason why I performed that song is because it's the closest I feel to Ashley. I don't do it for money or anything like that because you get peanuts to get on stage and perform records, 800 quid or something, make more money from property or from coaching but I do it because it's the closest I feel to him. And I'm so glad that he left that legacy behind where even though his body is gone, his voice and his legacy is still having people have the greatest night of their life because Body Groove is such an infectious, powerful party song. And and I say to everyone, tomorrow's not guaranteed and all of you guys have got something great that the world needs to see. But yeah, it 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 was traumatic and my brother's death. And I will always probably cry when I mention it because You know, from my dad crying, which is a, you just never hear Nigerian dads crying. Anyone that's, you don't have to be Nigerian, anyone's from any sort of ethnic minority, or even anywhere, it could be Irish, it could be British, men tell me don't cry from that generation. And to hear a man cry like that and the pain that my mum and dad went through, I mean, to lose their son. And as far as we know, it was COVID. He didn't get tested for COVID because it was too early. So his postmortems showed that he had um, fluid in his lungs. He had blood sepsis, and these were kind of classic markers for COVID. You know, being a black male that's middle age is a classic danger for COVID as well. Being a smoker, he had asthma when he was younger. He had all the classic symptoms that made him um, vulnerable to COVID. So as far as I know, it was COVID that killed him. But that period was hard because both my mum, you know, at the funeral, about 30 people at the funeral got COVID. The government was completely right to stop people gathering. I lost an auntie and an uncle. Um, that year as well to COVID and my mum and dad had COVID and it was touch and go for a long time. I was running around their house disinfecting banisters, doing everything I could, giving them pills, giving them medicine. I mean, everything to do I could keep to keep them alive because losing my brother, if I'd lost my parents or one of them, 
as strong as I am, I think that would probably have sent me over the edge. Um, so that was a tough, 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 tough year that I wouldn't want to repeat. And then there was like music, politics, and people saying all sorts. And I just lost my brother. And to hear people um, saying all sorts of stuff about my brother, it was it was the hardest year of my life. But what came out of that was a determination to honour my brother. So we remade Body Groove with Crystal. Um, that song went on to stream 20 million streams. And it was all in 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 honour of my brother. And almost everything I do every day of my life is in honour of Ashley. Because if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't have got into personal development. Because I took a book from him when I was... Um, yeah, I don't know how old I was. I might have been 14 or something. A book called Think and Grow Rich. You know that book, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Every entrepreneur on planet Earth is read yeah. Think and Grow Rich. And what I love about that book is not just about money, it's about mindset. You notice that with yep. that book. It teaches you anything's possible if you put your mind to it. And in a weird way, that book saved my life. Because when I was going through the worst of my own medical stuff, I knew that the answer to it was in me, that I, it was my mindset that I had to develop in order to survive what I was going through. And I thank God for Ashley. He was much more into self-development than I was at that young age. And he was an older brother that I looked up to. Um, and I learned from him. So him giving me the gift of personal development in many ways through that book. I was into it, but that book really changed my life. And then him being my partner in music and everything we went through in the music business from just the joy of making the boys mine and and the joy. I remember we we saw Peak Tong. You remember Peak Tong? Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, my proudest moment in the music business was one time we were in our price. Because you remember our price? We yeah. said, oh, don't we keep yeah, saying yeah, we remember yeah. this yeah. when we were young. <laughs> but I remember in our price, I picked up Music Week and Pete Tong had in his essential selection, Song of the Week, Architects, The Boy Is Mine. That's my proudest moment because it was the very first record we ever made. And to have someone like Pete Tong, and we were massively into house music. I mean, massive, more than we were into Garage. To have Pete Tong say that our record, that started off as a little idea in my head, um, ended up being his record of the week was my proudest moment. So, so much of my joyful moments were with Ashley. Do you know, so much of the moments in my life where I learned and I grew were with Ashley. So much of things that I learned was through Ashley. And Well, I know it wasn't easy, but um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Oh, God. Oh. It's tough. It is, it is a tough one to lose. To lose someone you love, um, and the fact that I didn't see him much in the months, for years in many ways, before he passed was was quite hard as well, you know. I mean, lucky I did see him about two months before he passed, and I remember speaking to him, and I kind of had a sense that it might be the last time I speak to him. I don't know why I had that. So I'm glad that I at least have got that. I'm glad I've got his voice on Body Groove. I'm glad I've got his memories. I'm glad I've got everything that he taught me, but I'm just so committed to honouring his legacy and make sure... No one forgets about him. He he was such a a beautiful soul. He was so humble. He didn't want fame. You would never have known he made Body Groove, really. He didn't sing about that or shout from the rooftops. He didn't even PA that track. I think he did that track as a PA once in his entire life. You know, and I had to force him to get on stage to even do that. He didn't brag. He was just such a humble, humble human being, but so infinitely talented, you know, and... He's one of the biggest reasons why I am so, so committed that people get their greatness now. You know, I've always been like that because I had to go for my journey. I've gone, I've been like that because obviously my dad's journey, but I think my brother's death was like, that just took it to another level. Like I will make a fool of myself if needs be, if someone gets their greatness, like money is not important to me. Um, nothing else. My own ego isn't important to me. What's important to me is, Everyone, anyone listening to us, anyone that knows me gets that they are great. And I don't care what you think about yourself. I don't care what that little voice says about yourself. I don't care what limiting beliefs you have about yourself. It's all bullshit. You are, am I allowed to say that, by the way? I can. Um, I've got a picture of my ass up there. You don't, think, oh, you, oh, you, yeah, you, you, you don't think we've got rules on here. But yeah, no, <laughs> people, people need to get how great they are. I mean, you're walking past people who every day, they just think their life is, that's it. And that's as good as it gets. And when you, when I speak to people, they're like, Trey, you're so confident and you're this. Or they see me on, on The Apprentice. You're so this and the way you speak. And you're, I wasn't like that. I was a sick kid and I was very anxious, very insecure. I would never pick up a mic and speak to anyone. 15, 16, 17, 18. Even at the time we made Body Groove, I wasn't that, that secure necessarily. And people look at me and think, you're so amazing, you're so this. I learned to be that way. 
And everyone has that possibility of being amazing. Everyone's got something great locked within them. And you have to get that out before you die. You have to. You can't get to the end of your life and regret. And they did study to show that what people regret at the end of their life is what they didn't do. No one regrets what they did do. It's what they didn't do. We all do stupid things. I've done stupid things. I've made a fool of myself. I've done things have failed. I've failed in business a billion times. I've failed in life. I've failed in relationship. But one thing is I tried. And I do not want to get to the end of my life and say, oh, man, I wish I'd done that. No, I did it. And I did it well, or I failed, or it was stupid, but I bloody did it. So anyone listening, do it. Go out, start that business. Tell that person you love them. Go and get married. So what if you end up in divorce three years later? Just do it. Live it. Be great. And if you're not doing it for you, do it for others. Because in the same way, I've been inspired by my dad, by the author of Think and Grow Rich, by some of the people I read in medical texts and things that I had to learn for myself. I've been inspired by so many people. Imagine they didn't step up. They wouldn't have read those books, listened to those songs. You know, one of my biggest heroes, for instance, is Beethoven, why he had tinnitus and he was deaf. You know, and, and what got me through some of the hardest times was listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, because I know the story of that Ninth Symphony. He was, he was t- totally tone deaf. And when he made that song, they had to turn him around in the concert hall in Vienna so he could get the applause. And in his diaries, he used to write, my life is not worth living, I should kill myself. But I recognise that my music is bigger than me. Can you imagine Beethoven wrote this? And there I was, this young lad in Notting Hill, suffering at times, and I'd listen to Ode to Joy and the the hope it would give me. And think about it, right? By all contemporary accounts, Beethoven was a miserable little sod. Miserable. Yet his music made a difference to me, what, 170 years after he made it, this little kid from an immigrant parent from Nigeria. I mean, who would, how would he have known that that song would have been one of the things that kept me going? Imagine that. So you have to go out there and create a legacy that reverberates through time because you don't know who you're going to inspire. Listen, we could go so deep on so many things and uh, I'm definitely going to be booking in an episode two and an episode three with you. But before you go today, uh, we cannot let you escape without talking about The Apprentice. Uh, which uh, obviously everybody's been watching, watching for the last couple of months, and uh, and loving you, I'm sure. How I mean, how did that experience come about? How did you get on there in the first place? Well, I've always been the biggest fan of Lord Sugar, and I've always watched that show relentlessly, apart from maybe the last couple of years. But massive fan of Lord Sugar from the days of of, of him being obviously in Amstrad, and again, you know, he always reminded me of my dad a little bit. This, this... He, you know, he was one of the first business books I ever read. Oh, I, really? I, I, I can see it today. Wow. My, my, my dad had a study where he spent all his life in there working, you know, this very old school bookcase, yeah. uh, and in it there was there was, there was was two, two or three books. I always remember, you know, there was, there was the... The Amstrad story mm-hmm. next to the joy of sex. As you do. <laughs> I always used to t- I always used to take the pair of them. <laughs> what a combo, bloody hell. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which I got better at, but uh, <laughs> I, I enjoyed them both equally. Bloody hell, dude. That's double pleasure, that is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alan. <laughs> so I mean I mean, come on. I mean, anyone of our age that wasn't inspired by Lord Sugar. And what I loved about it, he's just a normal working class lad, you know, and well, he did it in the days when it was hard for someone from him. He's, you know, a little Jewish kid from the East End of London, you know, didn't have anything, no advantages, and yet still went and absolutely killed it in business. You know, and he, even- He used to have the column in, I think, I don't remember if it was the Sun or the Mirror, but he used to have, he used to have a yeah. column in the newspaper where he'd be dishing out business advice. I always yeah. remember I was 16, 17, taking the school bus. And I, when I used to walk from home to the school bus, uh, well, it was, um, I used to I used to stop at the newsagent, buy the, whatever it was, the Sun or the Mirror, so I could sit on the back reading his column. I mean, imagine though, think about how many people he's inspired, because even me watching The Apprentice, and me, probably like millions of others, felt this sense of business is possible. I mean, obviously I already was, but, you know, my sort of journey obviously was in the creative world, but reading him and looking at him, you start thinking more of the corporate world as well. So he had a massive impact on me. So it was funny, it was my um, partner that encouraged me to go for it, you know, because I had all these ideas for these wellness products and things that I wanted to do, especially after my brother passed. And I really wanted to impact men's lives specifically because, you know, I coach men and women and women are just way ahead of men. Women are good, that they're killing it. You even see it on the show. But men are falling behind. Like you look at the suicide rates, uh, the health rates, um, homelessness, like men are falling behind. So I was like, I really want to make wellness products that are going to impact men and obviously branch it out and impact women because men are not the best um consumers. If you're gonna it's so niche when you sell to men. But anyway, I thought, right, I need a partner in this. My my um partner was saying to me, 
why don't you just audition for The Apprentice? And my first thought was like, oh, that's reality TV. I don't want to be on TV. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm yeah. from a background of I'm a cool musician. And even then I didn't want to be on the bloody box, let alone going on a box in what was felt like a reality TV. But she really made me think about it. It isn't reality TV. It's a business show. You know, it isn't Love Island. No disrespect to anyone that goes on Love Island. But, you know, this is a business show, which means you've got to show a level of um, confidence, competence, know-how, all the rest of it, which is great. I was like, you know what? Let me go for it. I think I, was, I went for it literally on the last day. Went there, did the auditions. They loved me. They thought I was great. Ace through the questions, ace, ace through the task, and got on the show. And it was, thank God I did it. It's probably the greatest experience of my life, you know, to sit in front of one of your childhood heroes every single week, even though there was a danger he might give you a bollocking, was the best experience ever. And when he would walk in, it would kind of walk um, through, you'd see him coming through these um, frosted windows. Everyone else gets terrified. But for me, it felt like watching my dad about to come in and sit down. I felt this sense of real love for, look, for, for Lord Sugar, like real sense of love because having read, his, you know, not all of the books that you've read, but, you know, read his autobiography and the rest of it and knowing about his, his journey, I felt so privileged to be sat in that boardroom with Lord Sugar. Like the only other person that might have made me feel that way would have been Richard Branson because there's always those two, isn't it, for yeah. us growing up that we looked up to. But and yeah, what, it was just incredible. What what would be what if you could take away one key lear learning experience or one one new thing that he either he taught you or the experience taught you that you're going to take into your businesses and your life? What would that be? Resilience. I think the word resilience has always been there with with me in my life. But when I look at um, Lord Sugar, knowing his story, knowing what he came from, you know, he went through hell in so many ways. Even when he when he bought Tottenham, he went through hell again. God knows how hard that must have been for him because those fans were brutal to him. You know, I can only imagine him in boardrooms where everyone's got these cut glass accents and here he comes with his East End accent. Do you know what I mean? I know he went for hell and I know in order to do that, he had to be resilient. And when he sat there, all I heard was resilient. And when he's firing people, I'm thinking a lot of people are losing, not because they're not good, but because they don't have the resilience. And in the case of The Apprentice, not the mental and emotional resilience. That show for me is more of a psychological show than it is a business show. Because you're in there, you're away from your loved ones. I mean, the BBC may not allow me to say that, but I'll say it anyway. Everything of yours is taken away from you. Your phone, even your watch. There's no Googling, no speaking to your loved ones, apart from maybe once a week, and even then you got a chaperone. For the entirety of the duration. For the entirety of the show. It's like you've gone into the army. It's not a joke. People on there sitting at home watching and, and thinking, these guys are stupid. If I put you in those conditions, you know, where you can't speak to anyone that you love, and bear in mind, I was getting married only a couple of months later. You know, my mum's got Parkinson's disease. My dad's recently been diagnosed. My parents weren't well, and I, I'm the primary carer for them. I had to leave everything behind to go into that show. You know, I'm in there in these quiet rooms, and you know, my tinnitus is going through the roof. Normally, it doesn't bother me, but in there, it did. Um, you need that level of resilience to do a show like that. And boy, did I learn how resilient I was to go into a show like that and, you know, mentally deal with, obviously, different personalities, I had to adopt a persona that wasn't me because I thought, don't go in there and be some brash guy, Trey, because Lord Sugar will fire you on the spot. He's going to look at this 49-year-old guy with his picky hair, you know, body groove. He couldn't care about that stuff, thinking this guy's not corporate. He's a musician. What's he doing in my boardroom? So I had to have a strategy of just lay low and get a sense of it, get a sense of who's around you and all the rest of it. And I had to rely on performing. I couldn't afford to be in the bottom three. I had to perform. And you'll see me on that show. I'm performing my ass off. I mean, I wanted my team to win all the time. Not just win, I wanted us to annihilate it because I'm so competitive as well. And we did, you know. Some of the highlights were things like the Formula E task. I think the previous record win was 1.2 million. My team, which I was PM for, took it up to 38.7 million. I don't think that record will ever be beaten. And I'm proud of those moments, really proud, because I didn't just do it on my own. There was a teamwork and I was able to manoeuvre the team and lead from the front for us to have those wins. You know, when I... A, I don't know if you haven't watched it, have you? I haven't seen it, no. On that Formula E, there's a bit where I go to the front and I give a speech about the environment and then the car trying to get sponsorship. But if you see the way I do it, the passion that comes out, it's not easy to do it when you've got cameras, you've got one take, you can't go back and do it again. And you're selling something that's always going to be a little bit dodgy. In our case, it was the advert and the logo. And you're having to turn things around and have these people get their wallets out and spend money, obviously, hypothetically, but spend money on sponsorship. I look at all these things, I'm just so proud, you know, for me to have gone on a show like that, from my background, we've got other people who are more from the business world. And for me to just go there and kill it like that, I'm proud, I'm genuinely proud. Well, it's a strategy that's clearly been yeah. working because yeah. we're, we're, we're 10 weeks in, you're down yeah. to the final five. 
whew, God, it, it it just feels it feels incredible. You know, I feel incredibly grateful. Now, don't get me wrong. When I went on that show, from the minute I applied, as far as I'm concerned, I'm like, at the minimum, you've got to get to the final five. At the minimum, I'm too competitive not to, because the way I saw it is the only competition I've got is me. As long as I can handle me, it's unlikely there's going to be someone in the house that is going to outcompete me. Now, they were incredible. They were actually much stronger than I thought they were. But I always knew that I would um, get this far. But still, when I look back, it is incredible. And I'm just bloody excited at what's to come. Like, just <laughs> God knows what's going to happen. Because I think this is a time when everyone really, really gets stuck in. Because you've competed. But now it's you against four of the sharpest minds that you could ever come across. And I would be lying to you if I said I wasn't a little bit terrified. Just a little bit. <laughs> now I'm here waiting to see what's going to happen in the final five of us. Who do you think your guys. biggest competition out of the final five, or your four competition are? In many ways, they all are. I'm not too sure on what everyone's business plans are, so I don't know. But I suspect for Phil and... Well, I suspect for Phil, Rachel and Paul, it's probably their own businesses. Um, so for me, with my startup idea competing against people with seasoned businesses, especially someone like Phil, whose business is an award-winning business, it's not going to be easy. But at the same time, you know, I'll always back myself in any race. And, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give it my all. And, and and I do know that about myself. I'm tough enough to deal with whatever comes my way. And I know those four interviewers are absolutely formidable, but I trust myself, you know, so I'm just backing myself at this point. Well, listen, in the hour that I've known you, uh, I would certainly back you as well. And Cheers, I'm going to dig out my VPN and uh, <laughs> <laughs> tune into the BBC and watch uh, and watch the next few weeks. Trey, it's been an absolute pleasure for you to have you here, mate. Uh, I've loved the conversation. I know the guys at home would have loved it too. Uh, wish we had more time. I definitely want to do a round two with you. Oh, so yeah, we're going to keep in two. touch. Uh, obviously, everybody knows you on the big, on the big screens, but uh, just give yourself a little shout out for how they can follow you, how they can find you if they want to get in touch. So yeah, guys, if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's at Trey Low. On TikTok, it's at Trey Low Official. And I believe LinkedIn is one platform that I like. So definitely follow me on there, Trey Low again, and, and reach out. And I think as well, if anyone that's been touched by anything I've said, especially maybe someone who might be suffering with tinnitus, because I get a lot of people like that, please reach out to me. Don't think, oh, Trey Low is going to be too bougie or too big to answer. I'll answer to anyone that's dealing with anything in life. Please reach out to me and I'll answer to that. But yeah, on those three channels. Thanks, buddy. Thanks a lot for being here. Thanks, brother, man. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thanks for watching Stripping Off with Matt Haycox. I hope you've enjoyed watching this week's episode, but please remember to like and hit that subscribe button so you can stay in the loop for future episodes. Have you got any burning questions? Have you got any killer ideas? Or well, slide into my DMs on social at Stripping Off with Matt Haycox or simply comment below. And I'll see you again next time.